welcome back to our journey through the book of Romans as uh, we reach Romans chapter 15, the, the last half of, of uh, chapter 15. And uh, as you may know, the, the mission statement for Kingfisher family of churches is that we exist to reach lost people and see them transformed into fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. That's a thoroughly biblical endeavor, which is why you can be sure that uh, as, as part of uh, Paul outlining the, the Christian faith to the, uh, the, the people in Rome and just taking them through the whole of the, the Christian faith and, uh, and, and, and what it means, sooner or later, he's going to focus on this goal of creating fully devoted disciples. And as he focuses on this issue now, he spells out just what it means to be such a person, what, what being a fully devoted follower of Christ looks like. It's absolutely great for us that he does this because we need to be very clear about what a fully devoted disciple looks like if we're going to be producing them in our churches. Now, what... Um, pulls most churches down, and indeed most Christians down, is a lack of clarity, a lack of focus on what they're aiming for. It's also good to know that the picture of full devotion that Paul paints in uh, this chapter of Romans isn't a theoretical one that doesn't really work in practice. It's a very practical, real picture because he bases it on himself. As he has already said to the church at Corinth, you should follow my example just as I follow Christ's. Now, he's not saying that he's perfect or that his style of worship is the only style. and he, He's not claiming godlike status and saying that they should worship and obey him. He's saying that where his life emulates Christ's, they should seek to emulate him. And not only him, but everyone who is pursuing full devotion. Dear brothers and sisters, he says to the Philippians, pattern your life, lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. So again, Paul isn't seeking to be worshipped. Indeed, when people tried to do that, he absolutely forbade it. He's simply saying that he truly believed he was pursuing full devotion, and so others should look at his life and where they recognised that pursuit of full devotion, they should draw encouragement and inspiration and, and seek to do the same. The same advice holds true for us as well. We need to emulate what Paul was pursuing because we want to be fully devoted followers of Christ just as much as those early Christians. So Paul highlights three key aspects to the pursuit of full devotion here in this uh, letter to the Roman church. Do these things, he says, and you will be a giant step closer to being a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. And the reason he brings this up now is that although he has devoted the previous 15 and a half chapters to what the Christian faith is all about, uh, they are not worth anything unless we actually put it into practice. And it becomes life action, not just head knowledge. The Bible is given to us pri not primarily for information, but for transformation. How do we encourage transformation in our lives so that we really do become fully devoted followers of Christ? Here's how, says Paul. Firstly, through knowing your place in God's plans. So many people waste their lives, not, not because they're lazy or they can't be bothered, but because they never understood God's plans and purposes for them. They never grasped hold of the unique role that God had called them to fulfill, and, and so they end up wasting their lives spending their time and energy doing the wrong things. Now, this could never be said of Paul. He said, I have written you quite boldly on some points, as if to remind you of them again, because of the grace 
that God gave me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. That's what he did. He was a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. He introduced Gentiles to Jesus Christ. Now, that's not his own plan. It's God's plan for his life. It's because of the grace God gave me. You know, he knew that he'd been called to be a minister, not the minister, but a minister. He had a sane and rational insight into God's plans for his life. He didn't see himself as being the answer to the whole world's problems. And neither was he God's only gift to this world. He knew that he was only part of God's great plan, but he was absolutely consumed with that part. It fired him up. It kept him going when the going got really tough. It made everything else seem irrelevant. He could think of nothing more exciting than completing the task that God had for him. But the important thing was he could articulate what that task was. Now, why was that important? Because it meant that he wasn't wasting his time doing things that sounded noble, but weren't what God had called him to. He was what he was able to articulate. He wrote, my ambition has always been to preach the good news where the name of Christ has never been heard, rather than where a church has already been started by someone else. To be fully devoted to Christ is to know what you were created in Christ to achieve and to bend all of your energies to that. Then Paul goes on to draw out a further implication to that. If you know your place in God's plans, then the second step you'll need to take is to make sure that you're fulfilling those plans rather than being too busy doing other things. And that means having a clear sense of God's priorities. You know, you and I have exactly enough time and exactly enough energy to achieve all that God has purposed for us to achieve. We need to arrange our time around our calling, otherwise our calling will never be more than wishful thinking. That was what Paul realised the Holy Spirit had been doing in his life when he'd been trying to get to Rome for quite some time. He realised, in fact, my visit to you has been delayed so long because I have been preaching in these other places. Because he was in the habit of cooperating with the Holy Spirit, he didn't just forge ahead and visit Rome anyway. He knew that his priority was to fulfill God's plans for his life and that those plans involved preaching the good news in places where no church had yet been established. Arranging our schedule around our calling involves a high degree of trust because we always think that the shortest route is the best route, but the shortest route is rarely God's route. The shortest route misses the essential stops along the way that are the growth points that God so longs for us to experience. The shortest route doesn't deal in the process of maturity, it deals in results now. And God's number one desire is for us to mature into being like Christ. And the way that works best is when we discover and do God's plans for our lives, no matter how that puts the more tempting plans on hold. Now, Paul knew this. He even knew that there was, uh, uh, that there was another thing that the law would have him do before he could embark for Rome. He writes, but before I come, I must go to Jerusalem to take a gift to the Christians there. Now, my guess is that Paul had not the faintest idea why this was on God's agenda for him to do before he could go to Rome. He didn't realise that in God's plans, Paul was going to be arrested and sent as a criminal to Rome whilst he was in Jerusalem. He just knew that this was God's priority for his life. 
And being a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ, there was nothing he wanted or desired more than to find and fulfil God's priorities. He knew that they always brought the greatest fruit and the maximum satisfaction. As he said to uh, uh, to the elders in, in Ephesus, as he made that very same journey to Jerusalem, he said, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Now that's a statement about priorities. God's will isn't nice to have so long as it doesn't cost too much in his life. No, God's will is the reason that he lives. Take God's will and God's plans and purposes out of life, and life is meaningless. So let me ask you two questions at this stage. The first is, are you taking steps to discover God's plans and purposes for your life? And secondly, are you ordering your time and your resources around them? The tragedy for all too many Christians is that they're too busy to even ask the questions, let alone do anything about reshaping their priorities and their timetables to match up to God's plans for their lives. Now, that may not mean that you do um, what I did and, and go into full time ministry, but it will mean that you have the time and the resources available to do what God is calling you to do. And that's a radical call, but it's what being fully devoted to Jesus Christ is all about. Well, there's a third aspect to pursuing full devotion, and it's a, a distinctive of the kingdom of God. It's the step of continuing to walk in humility. Now, in worldly terms, in worldly terms, the, the more you know and the further you get, the more confident and knowledgeable you become. If you can remember back to your school days, you may well remember the nervousness you felt on your first day at school. Everyone was bigger than you. Your oversized uniform made you look even smaller. The chances are you felt quite out of your depth. Fast forward to your final year at school, and the chances are that after years of growing and learning and getting used to the place, you felt much more confident and at ease. You might, might, might not have liked the place much, but you probably didn't still feel that same sense of being out of your depth. However, in the kingdom of God, maturity is measured not by your level of independence and confidence, but in your sense of growing dependence on God and your growing wonder at the wonder of God bothering with you at all, let alone sending his son to die for you. See, Paul's spiritual journey was marked by a growing sense of humility. He started off being confident about how much he knew and how well he could fulfill his calling. Now, years later, here's what he pleads with the Roman Christians to do. He says, dear brothers and sisters, I urge you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Do this because of your love given to you by the Holy Spirit. He's recognised along the way that he, the great Paul, apostle to the Gentiles, needs the prayer support of his fellow Christians, whether they've been Christians for five minutes or five decades. He recognises that without the power of prayer, his efforts are worthless, and he doesn't ask them to, to pray for him out of any loyalty that they might have towards him, but as they are inspired by the Holy Spirit because only Holy Spirit-inspired prayer is powerful and effective. Spiritual maturity is measured 
by a growing dependence upon the resources of God rather than a growing independence of them. The more mature you are, the more you realize you are incapable of doing anything worthwhile in your own strength. And um, this is something that Paul grew in, as I say, throughout his Christian life. Uh, he, he grew more and more aware of how much he needed the, the, the grace and the mercy of God and how much he needed the support of other praying believers. And that, that is maturity. The more Paul realized this, the more he realized that it was strength, not weakness, to ask his fellow Christians for prayer support. It's so easy for Christians to get into a spiritual pride which says, I pray for you, I'm too spiritually mature to need prayer from you. Paul saw that for the nonsense that it was. So look at uh, Romans chapter 15, verse 32. He says, pray that I will be rescued. Pray that the Christians there will be willing to accept the donation I'm bringing that by the will of God, I will be able to come to you and we will be an encouragement to each other. That's an incredibly humble statement. He acknowledges that he needs their prayer and then he looks forward to being encouraged and receiving from them when he gets there. A less anointed, less mature person would be blowing his own trumpet, telling them of all his great exploits, of how many people he has led to Christ, of how many miracles the Lord has done through him. Just like many Christian celebrities do today. But Paul looks forward to a time of mutual sharing, mutual blessing. Why? Because he was a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. He didn't need to blow his own trumpet. He didn't need to impress anyone. He didn't need to hype himself in any way. He considers everything he has so far achieved to be as rubbish compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus. For him, Jesus Christ is everything. Fully devoted followers of Christ can't really be uh, bothered with building personal reputation. They are far too sold out on the cause of Christ to worry about what their public image looks like. Which is, of course, why throughout history, God has used the most humble people in the most profound way. Because as Peter says, so humble yourselves under the mighty power of God and in his good time, he will honor you. That's the only honor that counts with fully devoted followers of Christ. As the old hymn says, riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Why is humility such a feature of fully devoted people? Because they have devoted themselves to seeking God's face. And when you get close to God's face and see the awesome splendor there, well, when you fix your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful gaze, then the things of the earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Just one glimpse of the face of God and we see ourselves as we truly are. There, there is a phrase that actually originates in the Bible and that phrase is about being the apple of someone's eye. You are the apple of my eye. It originates in the book of Zephaniah, where we're described as being the apple of God's eye. That word apple is more accurately translated as little man or little woman. What it's referring to is that what you see if you look directly into someone's eye at very close range 
you see a reflection of yourself. Not life-size, but rather you see your whole body reflected in that person's eye. You see yourself as you look into that person's eye. And supremely, you see yourself. You see your true self absolutely clearly as you look into God's eye. You see the little man. You see the little woman. You see an accurate picture of yourself as you gaze upon God. In other words, you come to see yourself for who you truly are, absolutely loved by God, the apple of his eye. But it also strips away the delusions and the excuses and so on. And we see the real us. And that is why people who pursue full devotion tend to become increasingly humble rather than increasingly self-sufficient or self-important. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God. And in his good time, he will honour you. God honours the humble because the humble see themselves as God sees them and sees God as he really is. As one 17th century writer, Thomas Wilson, put it, the greatest of all disorders is to think we are whole and need no help. But there's a little phrase in that verse that is often overlooked, but actually the key to growing full devotion. It's in his good time. See, the gulf that exists between our timing and God's timing is the, the pit that sinks many people. When God doesn't act in our time frame, we assume that God is unable or unwilling to act. So many people turn bitter and turn away from God because they have failed to understand or to trust in this phrase, in his good time. We know full well, most of us, that there are two Greek words for time. Chronos, which is the ticking of the clock where one moment is just like another. And Kairos, which is the appointed moment. Well, the word for time uh, in certainly 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 6 is Kairos. In his Kairos moment, he will honour us at just the right time. Not a moment early, not a moment late. And Paul had to learn that despite his longing to visit the Roman church as soon as possible, it would be in God's Kairos time. Waiting on God is the most difficult thing. And yet the reason that God ordains Kairos times rather than giving us everything in Kronos time is that it's in the waiting that we learn the most. Patience. Trust, obedience, humility. It's in the waiting that we develop into fully devoted followers of Christ. It's in the waiting that we develop passionate prayer lives. It's in the waiting that we position ourselves to be able to be honoured by God. If you're in the waiting time right now, if God has not delivered what he has promised, You've got two choices. You can grow bitter towards God because he's obviously let you down. Or you can hold on to that verse actually in 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 6. And you can begin to passionately seek God as to what he wants to use this waiting time to achieve. Now that's not easy. Growing as a fully devoted follower of Christ isn't easy. But it's what God has these waiting times for. If you look through the Bible at the times that God uses the desert, you'll get an understanding of how important these waiting times are. He used the desert to change the Hebrew slaves into a nation ready to conquer the promised land. He used the desert to change a runaway murderer called Moses into a man of integrity. 
He used the desert to prepare his son Jesus for his public ministry. God uses these waiting times as opportunities for preparation. Preparation to seize the Kairos time. If you're in the desert right now, it is not because God is not interested, but precisely because he is interested. And when you come out of the desert, God often brings things to pass with great speed. Now check that out for yourself in the Bible. Look at where God spends, uh, look at where people spend time in the desert and what happens when they come out of the desert. God's timing is perfect, but only those who are pursuing full devotion will truly benefit from the plans that he has for them. There is really no other option than to pursue full devotion. Like Peter once said to Jesus, Lord, where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. Whether we're currently in the desert or rejoicing in God's Kairos time, or just quietly getting on with life, each of us are really left with three questions that we have to answer because they are the deciding fact of whether we will be fully devoted followers of Christ or not. Do I know my place in God's plans? Do I have a clear sense of God's priority to my life? Am I growing in a sense of humility as I come to truly see myself in the eye of God? I want to commend those, those three questions to you as we continue looking at the uh, letter that Paul wrote to the Roman church. And um, as we continue in the last few chapters of the book of Romans, it's my desire that we are able, all of us who are, who are watching this, all of us who are in Kingfisher family of churches and ministries around the world, we're able, able to echo, echo from the depths of our hearts. Acts chapter 20, verse 24. However, I consider my life worth nothing if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Father, I pray for each one of us that our sights would be set and our hearts would be burned with the desire to be fully devoted to you, that we would not get distracted or overwhelmed by side issues in our lives, but we would arrange our priorities around living our lives as you have called us to live them, because our lives are worthless. No matter how much we achieve and no matter how much we, how much we, how much we, our lives are worthless unless we can say, I have run the race. I have kept the faith. And I'm now being given the crown of, of life. So, Lord, would you just speak to each of us about our priorities? Speak to each of us about whether we are indeed pursuing full devotion or just kidding ourselves. And Lord, I thank you for the opportunities you give us in the desert times to grow full devotion, that we may be truly, fully devoted to you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're back next time with our next instalment uh, uh, the book of Romans chapter 16 and uh, we're getting towards the end of Romans now so no, really hope you can stay with us with us and uh, be further blessed as we look at that together together until then have a blessed week and thank you for watching watching <laughs>